Good evening, everyone. Um, for those of you who are our guests and uh, to all our admitted students, welcome. Uh, I'm Isla Berman, the Dean of the School of Architecture, and it's with great pleasure that I'm able to introduce uh, Kai Uwe Bergman as our lecturer this evening. Kai is a graduate of UVA. He is uh, also the recipient of our Distinguished Alumni Award, which is given each year to our most prominent, distinguished, and successful alums, uh, of which he is one. Kai is a partner of Bjark Ingels Group, or, or the firm commonly known as BIG, which is based in both Copenhagen and New York. The founding uh, partner of the firm, Bjark Engels, was named by Time as one of the top 100 most influential people in the world. Uh, a great uh, thing for an architect. BIG is a multidisciplinary firm of architects, landscape architects, interior designers, product designers. Uh, and BIG positions itself as producing an architecture, they say, that emerges out of an analysis of how contemporary life evolves in response to multicultural exchange, global economic flows, and communication technologies, which all require new forms of urban and architectural organization. Projects like the uh, Air Plus Port proposal for Greenland for the Danish Pavilion and the 2012 Venice Biennale make this point by resituating social and economic pr uh, problems of the project within a larger context that links up global urbanization and transcontinental connectivity and environmental change. In this particular case, the new role that Greenland might play when the logistics of geographies and intercontinental transportation are reconfigured because of global warming. In a very short span of time, BIG has become extremely successful as a practice. Uh, I would say one of the most uh, successful practices on the globe right now. It's known for its innovative and experimental approach, both to the conceptual and formal spatial aspects of architecture, while also addressing economic, social, and environmental issues in both a practical and highly playful way. Uh, coined as the oeuvre of the pragmatic utopia. Perhaps one of the best examples of this that came to mind for me uh, was their waste to energy plant in Copenhagen um, that has brought new forms of architectural uh, attention to environmental issues, sort of thinking, giving the same amount uh, of attention to a waste to energy plant as we might uh, to a cultural uh, work of architecture or museum but whose innovative roof also doubles as a ski slope, bringing the Alps to the flatlands of Denmark. The firm is known for a number of projects, including earlier works, uh, their, some of their most important uh, initial works in Copenhagen, three major housing complexes, uh, the mountain dwellings, and VM and 8H houses, as well as uh, many projects, uh, uh, innumerable uh, in Asia, the Middle East, the United States, and Canada. One that is actually right around the corner uh, from our place in Toronto, I might add. Uh, Kai Bergman heads up uh, Big's business development, overseeing the architectural work of the firm in 25 countries across the globe. He was the project manager leading Central Asia's first carbon neutral master plan project for Zero Island and has been involved in many of the firm's most critical projects, including the development uh, of the Big U, uh, also known as the Dry Line. Uh, I love that. Uh, a project developed in the aftermath of Hurricane Sandy to generate a 10-mile elevated ribbon and compartmentalized and highly programmed bermscape running from West 57th Street south to the Battery and then north to East 42nd Street. So this was basically a U uh, in Lower Manhattan that was to protect uh, Lower Manhattan from future storm surges by rethinking the area's low-lying topography. Kai Uwe also sits on the board of the Van Allen Institute in New York, and I'm happy to say I just invited him to sit on the Dean's Advisory Board uh, for UVA School of Architecture, and by my announcing it, he can't back out now uh, because he said yes. Um, and he has served on a number of juries, including the Swiss International Wholesome Awards in Zurich and the Architecture Awards in Luxembourg and, and Bucharest. He received his Master of Architecture 
uh, degree from UCLA and his undergraduate degree in architecture uh, from UVA. Uh, please join me in welcoming Kai Bergman. Uh, wow. Uh, it is uh, truly an honor uh, to be here um, and also uh, see many friends, old friends, uh, professors, and uh, also students amongst you. Um, I would actually like to see a uh, hands up for all of the folks that are considering UVA. Just uh, quickly. Fantastic. So a good portion of you guys. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about my own story uh, of being here. I think um, the, the thing that I treasure most is actually how holistic the school goes about uh, looking at architecture. Uh, by that I mean you have all of the different departments, uh, landscape, uh, history, uh, preservation, and uh, design. Um, and I have to say that you can voraciously, uh, uh, if you have an appetite for this, actually dig in and get involved in all of those. Uh, I had four years here, um, and I had a pretty big appetite. So I, I kind of like took whatever I could. I also went on the sort of uh, foreign abroad programs. Um, and I, I think it's made me who I am today. So you'll see that I have actually uh, many interests. Um, I'm also just recently uh, heading up Big's landscape department that you may have heard uh, has just been started. We have 15 landscape architects now working within Big on projects like the Big U. Um, and that's, that's a kind of love that started in this room with Reuben Rainey um, 25 years ago. So to think of how kind of a lecture about Aboriginal uh, walkabouts can actually lead to leading a landscape department within a large architecture office is a pretty phenomenal thing. Um, so I, I hope that uh, today's lecture will also send your thoughts sort of uh, running and coursing through, uh, through your minds to kind of see how you can also uh, let Charlottesville be that, uh, that place uh, for you and your future. Um, and I'll take this opportunity also to kind of like describe a little bit about um, BIG and our kind of design process. Uh, for many of you, because I've spoken here I think two or three times now over the last few years, you'll see a few things that are probably from the last presentations, but I've actually peppered it with a lot of new stuff. So uh, sit back and, uh, and buckle up. Um, I actually wanted to start with our very first projects because I felt, uh, f especially for uh, kind of the folks that are just starting uh, into uh, architecture, uh, that the question always is kind of like, how do you actually get your start? Uh, this is a project called the VM Houses. It was completed in 2006 um, at, uh, is that correct? 2006 is correct. Um, and at the time, uh, Bjarke and Julien, this was done under plot, were about 30 to 31 years old. Uh, they had uh, completed their studies. Uh, they both had master programs from Berlage and from uh, Barcelona and Copenhagen, and then worked for a couple of years at OMA, both of them, uh, then started their own office in 2001. Um, so this actually finished in 2005, sorry. Um, and they, uh, they, they, they very much were interested uh, to work at uh, both a grand scale, because they had these experiences from working at OMA. Uh, Bjarke worked on the Seattle Central Library. Um, and they wanted to be engaged with uh, design thinking uh, on all scales. So um, I, I have to tell this story because it's, it's a really kind of funny story. Uh, the first client, um, the first real client, because they, they did the bathing platform for the city that everyone knows about Copenhagen and Harbor Bath. They also did a little youth house uh, that was maritime uh, that was also for the city. But the first kind of uh, private client was named Per Hupfner. And he actually met um, one of the big guys uh, in, the, uh, in the men's room. And uh, uh, the, uh, David Zala, one of the partners, heard uh, him blasphemy sort of architects, like, ugh, architects. Who do they think they are? 
And, uh, and, and David was kind of like quizzical and just said, what do you mean? Why, why are you so down on architects? I'm an architect. And, uh, and the guy goes, well, you know, you, you, uh, you just uh, think that you know everything, but you really, really know nothing. And, uh, and so then David just said basically, well, we just started an architecture office, and uh, would you give us a chance? And Pear was thinking, ah, oh, young architect, they will be cheap. Um, and so he actually did then uh, plan a meeting. Um, at the time, he was going to do a housing project uh, with 250 units in a brand new part of Copenhagen. And he was going to basically enlist four young architects cheap uh, to do this project because not one of those would be able to do the whole project. It would be simply too large. And um, so think of this project, uh, the VM houses, is actually sort of four kind of uh, tower, housing tower projects, one in each corner. And that was typically what he had envisioned. Um, when uh, he came in and met Bjarke and Julien and, and David, at the time the office was probably about uh, 10 people, Um, they, uh, they literally talked about, uh, uh, he, you have about two weeks, come up with a great tower scheme for, you know, for about, uh, 70 units. And so, uh, Bjarke and everybody went back, they designed something, uh, they come back two weeks later and they say, well, you know, we could do this tower and then you'd have three other towers along. But if you give us actually, uh, this whole like side, We can do a V shape, and that way the people are never looking into the tower. They're sort of always looking uh, beside, you know, aside uh, from, from not looking into one or the other building. And so the client said, well, that's a really great idea. Sure, I'll give you the V. Uh, and then I just need two other young architects. And then two weeks later, they came back and they said, well, if you give us the other two towers, we can make an M. And then, you, again, we can like sort of just like look past all, you know, you can have the density of 250 units and you don't need to look into each other's uh, 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 bedrooms. And this is, uh, this is a great concept. And the guy's like, I love it. Okay, I'll just hire you guys. You do the whole thing. So, uh, and they were probably about 29 years old at the time. And that led then three years later uh, to actually having the VM houses built um, as their first project. And the, the, the project is a really important one because it also spoke to um, actually the whole thinking um, of BIG, which is um, when a challenge comes your way, which was in this case, they had designed rectilinear balconies that you would see everywhere. Um, and you have two points of connection at the base, and then you have two struts that connect at the top. Um, and the client said, I don't have a lot of money left, so I need to save some money. Can you guys save some money? And then we came up with, oh, well, let's do a triangular one. We save one strut. And uh, we save 80 points of connection through the, through the facade, and we get this triangular facade. And the client said, you know what? I love this because, you know, when I sell these apartments, everyone will go out and they'll be king of the world uh, out at the, at the tip of the balconies. <laughs> And so, you know, it was this kind of, the challenge was there, but then it was like how you actually deal with those challenges. And what it does is it creates an entirely new landscape, one that really uh, wasn't there before, which is a vertical landscape that you can now see all of your uh, neighbors. And imagine sort of being on this facade and you're grilling and everybody's out and enjoying the sunset, and then you sort of need some salt and you just sort of yell down and then, the salt sort of gets sort of carried over to you and, and you can sort of grill. Um, and that's that shared kind of social landscape that I think also is a very important ingredient in the way that Scandinavians work. Um, you have the same kind of pragmatic uh, architecture and formalism that comes out of uh, Holland, um, where OMA kind of And, and the super Dutch, the MVRDVs of the world, and the Meccanos really created a very formalistic kind of approach to architecture that was rooted in pragmatism. What the Scandinavians have done over the last decade to 15 years, I think, is to give a social kind of uh, layer, a social kind of um, nuance to how that formalism actually works. And that's how I'd like you to also think about sort of the, the projects that you see is um, how do they work kind of within the city? 
how do they work um, and, and sort of provide uh, support uh, to uh, the larger issues of equity and um, of uh, building something for a much larger idea than just the back pocket of a, of a client. Um, in Denmark, of course, it's very dark, so daylight is a premium. And you can see how the daylight just moves through these units and even look at the stair, it's actually a perforated metal panel. So just by perforating the metal, we're able to sort of bring that daylight and pierce it through of what would otherwise obstruct the, 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 the daylight and make things a lot darker than they, they need to be. So um, this is an important project and that client actually helped then uh, they, they sold 250 units in three weeks, which was 2005, six. Uh, then the client purchased the property next door and by 2008 built the mountain, uh, which is uh, 80 units of housing on top of 450 parking spaces. And uh, same client, uh, Per Hüpfner, and uh, he's, uh, he's, again, just a, a gentleman that just really thinks about how he can squeeze out the most out of the properties that he makes. So, uh, and he's a design-build contractor. That's a, another important part, I think, in our making is that we had a contractor uh, building our first three projects. And they have a very bottom line kind of approach to thinking. But this, and, and, and the city already gave us a challenge right from the start because the master plan had said, we want a, a yellow parking garage with a blue housing bar next to it. And we just sort of said, it's, it's so sad that the first few floors of the residential are looking into a parking garage. Uh, you know, those, those are not gonna be very nice units. So could you imagine of actually sort of uh, placing the housing on top of a foundation of parking and then cutting away uh, the very kind of views uh, corridors that we were sort of creating with the V and the M um, so that you know, you're, again, taking something out of the pocket of the, of the client, but you're also stating why, because then the value of the VM sort of maintains itself. And um, you have 80 south-facing units that are very sort of uh, very luxurious. Uh, we have 3,000 metal panels that are perforated with Mount Everest. You've already heard about a ski slope on top of a power plant. Well, you can live on top of Mount Everest in Denmark. Uh, and uh, that was a, a thing that the client, again, really, really liked. Um, we have seven floors of parking uh, that ramp up. And we really have six facades in this building. We have the four facades, we have the roof, and we have the underside of the residential uh, underneath the, the parking. So that is actually very sort of colorful and metallic and really sort of uh, looks and is inspired by the same metals of the cars that are parked underneath it. As you move into the units, it goes completely neutral and you use sort of uh, um, natural materials, and the emphasis is really on the outdoors, the landscape. The ability to sort of move from your uh, 1,200 square feet interior to your 600 square foot exterior, uh, even on the 10th and 11th floor, you're able to sort of really have a suburban lifestyle, uh, even though you're living 10, 11 floors above the ground. So that's something that you know, was a typology that really didn't exist. Um, and this client and this contractor really gave us the chance to explore it, uh, which uh, we're really, really thankful. Well, uh, and, and it sort of allows people to actually enjoy suburbia because it does have some very nice qualities, especially safety, the ability of moving indoor and outdoor, your kids being able to sort of play. Uh, those are things that are very important to a lot of people. And so as we move into more urban conditions and suburbia, it's very hard to imagine it just going on and on forever. That's a way of actually capturing the suburban qualities that we all cherish and making them a little bit more urban uh, with a project like the mountain. Um, so uh, we uh, then uh, f did our third project with the same client, same group of engineers and um, all the consultant teams were the, were the same. So you can see how uh, the first five years, I, I started uh, working with, with Bjarke in 2006. Really the first um, 
uh, five to six, even seven years, all of uh, our projects were within 100 kilometers of, of Copenhagen. So really nothing ever went out. The first project that we uh, did outside of Copenhagen was the Danish Pavilion in Shanghai. That was 2010. So um, it's, it's, it's really this kind of laboratory uh, that is Copenhagen that allowed us to kind of investigate this. And there you have suburbia on the right side. Uh, that's, that was the 1960s ideal, also in Europe, you know, Europe and America. Uh, you wanted to have your single family detached house in a, in a sea of uh, sort of uh, yards and greens. Uh, but this, the, you know, Copenhagen and Denmark is a kind of, it doesn't produce more land. Uh, the land is getting engulfed by this kind of 60s, 70s kind of dream of suburbia. So the city had to sort of say, stop. And then the city created this new neighborhood called Urestad, uh, where uh, basically 50,000 people uh, live and 50,000 people work. Uh, so it's kind of a, a, a master planned community. And we created the eight house, which is now 500 units of housing. So 1,000 people will live there or are, are living there now. Um, it's uh, in Danish construction, everything is prefabricated these like, concrete elements like Lego blocks. So you go to a catalog and you see what types of uh, prefabricated concrete you can use. Uh, they tell you what the stair lengths are. They tell you all these di different things. So uh, imagine how limiting that could be. And if you actually look at Danish architecture, uh, pretty much from the 60s through, um, through the early 2000s, uh, it was actually 95% is very kind of conscripted and, and kind of the widths and everything was based on these kind of available units. And um, there's one bathroom pod for this entire complex. Uh, there are 500 units, but 125 different unit types and one bathroom pod. So try to make all of that work out. Um, it's like a Tetris game uh, where you're creating a lot of different pieces that all have to fit together uh, in order to make this. Uh, the, the amazing things about uh, this building is that it has no parking spaces, um, 500 units. Uh, it's kind of the Danes, again, socially engineering people and how they live and think. So they want to prioritize bicycling. They want to uh, make it easy and accessible to public transportation. So there's a metro station, just a two-minute walk from here. Um, and we took that as our design kind of inspiration to design a building that uh, you can actually bicycle up. So th it has a ramp that starts in three different areas and then ramps up all the way to your 10th house, 10th floor uh, penthouse apartment. So you can either bike down or, or take your uh, kitty uh, uh, baby carriage uh, up. Um, it, it's really this kind of uh, road that goes uh, basically into the sky. Um, and it's a really r remarkable building. I, I would really encourage you guys, if you're ever in Copenhagen, to go see it, to actually see it live uh, and see how it functions and works. Um, because they're, they're, you know, the 60s and 70s had a lot of large-scale housing projects around the world, and uh, a few of those are successful, uh, but many, many were not. Um, and, you know, Prude Igo is just one example of a very large kind of housing complex that just didn't understand the kind of social uh, life quality aspect of just providing uh, large scale housing. And I think these are, these are issues that we really have to deal with as architects uh, as uh, projects grow and housing becomes uh, such an important piece. Um, but what you can see here is that we basically use three, four different uh, typologies. We, have, uh, we basically have stores at the base uh, there's also office above. Then we have uh, row houses, flats, and penthouses above that. And then we basically uh, are pushing and pulling those. Uh, so in the north, you have more office pushing the residential up so it has views and sunlight. And in the south, we actually push uh, the, uh, the, the piece down so that the interior units also have views out to the view and to the sun. So um, the, the reason the eight house kind of looks the way it does is that it's actually also kind of connected to the sun diagram. 
and how the sun is moving through the sky and seeing where uh, we need to bring uh, light uh, into uh, the units. Um, then I'm also really, as, as a master planner, I'm uh, really thankful for this. This is uh, a retention pond. Uh, imagine you're, you're living on the southernmost tip of Copenhagen in this brand new neighborhood, and all the rainwater uh, goes straight from the buildings and the streets into uh, large-scale retention ponds. And, uh, you know, it's, it's really remarkable. People pay more money uh, to look at water than they do dirt. And so why on earth do we take rainwater and place it underground into pipes and then make ourselves a bunch of trouble because the pipes are too small uh, during major rain events? And so we, we take something that has value uh, and we try to, like, uh, make it disappear. Uh, and, and just imagine if we could actually see it as a wonderful thing that we have retention ponds within our developments and that the city actually thinks of it holistically as a city scale issue and thinks about the sort of major rain events where certain parks can then become you know, flood areas. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's another ingredient in city making and place making that could be uh, really advantageous because now you, people actually move here because of the quality that the water gives. Uh, it's also seasonal, so you can skate on it, you can kayak on it, um, and it, it's an amenity for the folks that actually live there. Um, and, and so uh, I think the Eight House has a lot of different kind of uh, uh, social qualities. That uh, There's a movie that was made by the Beccas. Um, they had made a movie of Rem Kuhas's uh, Bordeaux house uh, following the, the cleaning lady around uh, how to vacuum a triangular room, a uh, super hilarious movie. Uh, they lived in this building for 30 days, and they have done a really masterful piece of capturing the qualities, uh, both the good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, the pizza man that can't find the apartment that he actually has to deliver the pizzas to, so they're cold by the time they reach them. Uh, so, so there are you know, these wonderful things that are uh, really uh, uh, interesting to, to see how your work of uh, design actually performs. Um, I've just shown you three projects, and they were really important projects in the first sort of, uh, I would say, 15 years of, uh, of Plot and Big. Uh, we were producing, up until last year, only about a project a year. Um, that's a really important little factoid because I think that it's, it's kind of, you know, you, you, our profession takes so long to actually get anything done or built. Sometimes, you know, if you get to do something in five years, that's at the speed of light. Usually these things take 10 or even 15 years to actually see uh, from a design to a realization. So what is about to happen is I think uh, is going to really change uh, both your or people's perceptions of what big is and can do. Um, I think there are a lot of people that uh, kind of consider us diagrammat diagrammaticists or kind of, uh, uh, you know, we, we design diagrams. But uh, I hope today to show you a variety of buildings. We finished six buildings in the last six months, and we're going to probably finish about eight to ten buildings every year from now on. Um, and so there's going to be a lot more to actually look and, and get a feel for and to uh, experience. Um, just to finish on the eight house, so these are the different programs from penthouses, apartments, row houses, and retail. And uh, this is what we really do is we work with the kind of the traditional widths of the different programs. So retail needs a certain width. Uh, then you have townhouses. That gives us a chance to place that ramp there. Then we have flats with balconies on both sides. And then we have a penthouse at the top that, again, le lets us sort of uh, create that ramp that's just continuous. So you can walk up a ramp without ever uh, climbing a stair from the ground level to the 10th floor. So <coughs> you, uh, we, we moved to New York in 2006. And uh, I uh, joined Bjarke and a, couple of, a handful of other folks uh, there. Uh, one of the things that we really appreciate about New York is just how incredibly malleable it is and how it is just continuously changing. So if you've been there recently, I think uh, a couple of UVA classes were up there just a month ago. 
Uh, if you come back in five years, it's going to be, again, a, a, a sort of continuously changing place. This is 1940s, and you see that, you know, New York, like America, is all about commerce and capitalism. So the entire water's edge was all about kind of ships and trade and warehouses. You didn't really want to live on the edge because it was just dirty, it was noisy, it was traffic, people died because of getting run over. So uh, that's also one of the reasons that Central Park is in the center of the island and why that was kind of the most valued real estate um, was because the water's edge was not. But what has occurred over the last 10 to 15 years is utterly remarkable. So you have had the Hudson River Park on the west side, the Battery. Uh, now you have Brooklyn Bridge Park. You have, uh, we're working on the east um, side, uh, re coastal resiliency. You have Governor's Island from West 8. And it, it's really moving towards uh, a co totally connected green edge that is also changing the very kind of uh, um, qualities of architecture along that edge. I, I always say that landscape architects in New York are the true rock stars uh, because they are creating these incredible amenities, public realms, and the architects are purely accessorizing it. So, um, you know, the, the High Line is the masterpiece, and now you're seeing all of the architecture pop up around it. Uh, Brooklyn Bridge Park is the masterpiece, and now you're seeing other pro projects sort of pop up around it. So get to know your landscape colleagues because they will one day give you work, I think, uh, if this continues, this trend. Um, and we were lucky enough to design the West 57th project that was, again, right along this changing waterfront because... You know, in the 1930s, McKim, Mead, and White built an energy plant. Uh, uh, and then uh, in the 1970s and 80s, they built a trash distribution center right next to this. was not, this is called Hell's Kitchen. So this is not where you want to live. But then again, now it's changing. So we, we've designed and built a 700-unit uh, housing uh, project that is right on that edge. And uh, so here it is in relationship to Central Park. And really what West 57th is, is this idea of the typical kind of residential project in New York for the last 50 to 60 years has been a skyscraper, uh, basically a high rise on top of a podium. And in Europe, where we come from, uh, it's been the courtyard, like 95% of Copenhagen is uh, courtyards. So what happens when you kind of marry the skyscraper with the courtyard? You kind of create a new typology called the court scraper. And, uh, it's really about how to bring the qualities of the courtyard, the European one, which is on the ground level, uh, and uh, realizing that it's a lot about sort of protecting views of your neighbors. Uh, but in this case, we actually raise the courtyard to the second level. That's a, a huge one because then you have a full podium at the base. Then we pick up 44 stories the uh, tip of the uh, of the project to actually preserve the views of the building uh, that's adjacent to you. The sun travels around on the south side, bringing sunlight into the courtyard. And um, you know, by pr preserving views of your neighbors, that's how you make friends. So that's a, a very important kind of uh, a bit to to remember uh, when you are sort of designing projects. Is that you have to get as many friends. Uh, in this kind of exercise uh, to help you um, manage and make it through to, uh, to, different, uh, to different boards and uh, community groups, uh, as well as uh, the regulatory uh, folks. So here is the West 57th project, um, just as it was finishing in May. And we're hoping really that the court scraper, that this idea of actually bringing a European quality, which is, again, you can send your kids down to play in the courtyard. Uh, the courtyard has a very kind of generous dimension. So what, what Central Park is at the city scale, uh, we do uh, proportionately 13,000 times smaller uh, in the building scale. And uh, uh, it's, it's the same width as a street, actually. This is 60 feet uh, from side to side. And if you look at just how close we cut it, Take a look at those uh, little uh, bay windows above. Uh, basically, we are doing 60 feet 
from where this edge right there uh, hits the other side, and then above it we can actually move into the into the 60 feet. Um, so we, we capture just a little bit of view uh, to the water from each unit. And um, it's, a, it's a very wonderful vegetation that Star White House landscape architects did in, in New York. It offers places to grill, there's a meadow to lay, um, and a lot of different uh, uh, plants. And you have, uh, because this is a rental property, you have a lot of amenities as well uh, in New York. Um, and so you have, uh, we, in the base of the building where you have a lot of depth, we uh, are able to sort of place all of these different poker rooms and, uh, and uh, pools and basketball arenas. But I mean, truly imagine living in Hell's Kitchen and this is your view. So uh, these are the kind of projects that we hope to also kind of populate uh, in New York um, over the years to come. And, um, there's a lot of architecture uh, and resolution that has to go into making any of these projects feasible and also buildable. So we have to work with contractors, build things to the same market prices as a traditional tower scheme. Uh, I always found it really hilarious when I had engineers at t asking me about this project, because again, it was on the boards for six to seven years <laughs> before it was actually built. So. Uh, they would say, oh, this building looks really difficult. Um, it must be an engineering nightmare. And I'm like, um, what planet do you live in? Because the hardest building to build is actually a slab that goes up like a domino. And when you blow on a domino, it falls over. I truly can tell you to blow as hard as you want on this building, and it will never blow over because it's the smallest at the top and it has the, f you know, the fattest base at the bottom. So the most structurally sound uh, uh, structure on the planet is a mountain. And uh, the more mountains we build, the fewer uh, uh, issues we will have with engineers uh, having to like build thick cores or having to like completely uh, uh, double and triple uh, uh, design um, the, the, the resistance to the wind. So a glass skyscraper is actually a much harder nut to solve engineering-wise than a mountain uh, sc scaled project. But this is just because our attitudes within construction are so conservative that we don't get out of what everyone does. And I think that's another lesson to learn is like when you guys actually design something else, it's gonna be that much tougher to actually take it through uh, construction and get it built. Uh, and you just have to have really pragmatic, sound arguments as to why and how. And sometimes you even have to prove it uh, as, as in order to get uh, these things built. So um, again, if you're in New York, I would really encourage you guys to, uh, to get in there and to uh, tell them that you are looking for an apartment and the leasing office will take you for a tour. Uh, don't come as 15 students. Uh, just come individually every half hour. Uh, <laughs> and you'll, you'll get in. So uh, we finished uh, the Mount, uh, we finished uh, West 57th. We finished uh, Coconut Grove in Miami. These are two residential projects uh, inspired by kind of the, the Miami vernacular. Uh, that uh, we love, and also actually the incredible vegetation along uh, the coastline and especially in Coconut Grove. Um, and we wanted to kind of highlight the views. So here are two towers that, you know, there's nothing special about them uh, other than their placement. And then I would ask you just to look at the kind of generosity of space. Uh, these two towers were designed to be one in front of the other. And so historically, the back tower was always worth less and thus uh, got less money than the, the front. So the reason we did the twist was to see if we could psychologically get people to see it as side by side and twins, and they would pay the same price for the back tower as the front tower. So that actually happened. And um, we did it also by uh, joining them uh, with a very lush landscape and having one entrance in the middle that then uh, would provide entrances into both towers. So you were never at a disadvantage. You have the same views, uh, you have the same scale, everything is the same, um, and uh, people 
bought it. Um, so here's the entrance. Uh, this is the, the reception area. Uh, and again, a lot of emphasis on that ground level kind of a, a greenness. Um, and just uh, incredibly generous uh, floor to floor heights, the largest uh, sliding glass doors that are hurricane proof. Um, and folks are starting to move in. This is a Miami pick. <laughs> have to have to throw in the pool at the top, um, and we have uh, you know this is another project that we finished over the last six months, which is uh, the opposite end. This is uh, one of the hardest things right now in Copenhagen um, is to get uh, student housing. Uh, there are forty thousand students in Copenhagen that still live with their parents because they literally have no dorms or no places to live that uh, are made for students. So. Uh, a dad who was trying to get his kid out of the uh, house uh, <laughs> couldn't. And so he came to us two years ago and said, how do I get my kid out of my house? And uh, can you help me? And so he was a normal business guy. And he uh, had this idea of recycling shipping containers. This is nothing new. Uh, shipping containers have been recycled uh, almost as long as there have been shipping containers. But what we decided to do with him was to look for a way to create kind of a prototype that could be scalable uh, and could actually uh, take advantage of brownfield sites in most coastal areas. Uh, you have you know, almost large kind of uh, shipping uh, areas or you have large uh, shipbuilding areas, uh, places that no longer have the same function as they used to. And uh, perhaps you're, and, and they all have utilities but you're not allowed to build on them because the ground is like so nasty. And so why don't you build something that floats that you can just come up and hook into the utilities that are already there and you're actually in the center of most cities. Uh, so we then looked at how to make this uh, completely kind of self-sufficient in terms of solar power. Uh, we deal with the waste uh, treatment in the, in the basement um, and uh, we then can replicate them and create little villages. Um, we can double wide them. Um, and uh, we're uh, actually uh, making this into kind of an, an idea that could actually scale across Europe or anywhere else. And the, uh, here is the Polish uh, shipbuilding yard where we cast the, the ballast because most floating things are, are bobbing up and down a lot. So you need ballast to actually s make sure that the bobbing is as little as possible. And so it has an entire basement that basically is like a big bathtub. And that's where there's a, a community room and uh, uh, the sanitation is dealt with and a few other things. So that's down there. And then we have the recycled shipping container. So we're upcycling basically. Um, and we uh, tugged it over from Copenhagen, uh, from Poland to Copenhagen. And there are now students living aboard for about $600 a month. Um, they are living uh, in the center of the harbor with views that are better than the uh, five-star Marriott uh, that's uh, uh, also along the harbor. So wouldn't you like to be a student in Copenhagen uh, right now? Um, the other thing is, yeah, we'll, we'll get a little funky. Um, so uh, Copenhagen has basically said that they're going to uh, do a few of these. And we're doing them in Gothenburg and in Le Havre, France as well. So uh, the uh, father is now a businessman. Uh, he's now working with Maersk, the largest shipping container producer on the planet, uh, of actually how to upscale, uh, upcycle their, uh, their, their uh, facilities. And then the other thing that uh, I'm sure that you all know and you've seen in the news is that uh, there have been over two to three million refugees over the last, uh, say, two years coming into Europe. And they needed housing. 
Um, and uh, one of the things, uh, many cities had absolutely no place to place them. And so they're living in like gyms uh, with makeshift beds and even today. Uh, the typical, when you have refugee housing, uh, the typical length that a refugee will stay in refugee tent villages or things that you've heard of around the world is actually 17 years. Uh, it's not a one, two, or three year kind of thing. Uh, in many cases, people don't go back or they can't go back for political reasons, and so they stay. And uh, so I think a, a really important thing is that these uh, can be built in half the time than typical housing, and they're built at one-fifth the cost uh, of uh, a typical bed for a student. Uh, so imagine the dorms that are being built uh, here on the, in the campus. They run around uh, eighty dollars to $90,000 a bed, and this is being built for fifteen dollars to $20,000 a bed. So this is uh, one way that we felt could also deal not only with the shortage of student housing, but this is also something that could have a much larger impact uh, to actually deal with the refugee crisis that uh, Europe is currently uh, happening. Um, another project that just finished is in Philadelphia. Uh, this is the Navy Yards uh, in Philadelphia. Uh, this is what it looked like in the 1940s and 50s, um, and now it's being turned into an office park with a few kind of boneyards uh, with, with a few naval ships. And this is a Robert Stern master plan, and there is the site that we were given. Uh, this is a spec office uh, building. Now, uh, spec office buildings are kind of the lowest of the low uh, in the architectural food chain. Uh, they are built with no person in mind for the lowest common dollar amount. And uh, usually, it's what you see on the side of the roads or in office parks. So it's also not really uh, has uh, much architectural um, ambition. So, <clears throat> but you have to give it to these guys. Uh, Liberty uh, Properties in, uh, in uh, Philadelphia actually wants to do something. So they hired uh, field operations to design this uh, park as the first piece. Then they have a few historical buildings that they're keeping, and then they're building all of these like blocks around. Uh, the funny thing that we thought was here they have field ops creating this kind of really circular kind of heart to the, uh, the new area, but then they kind of cord it off with these straight streets. So the first thing that we asked was, couldn't we in front of our uh, building actually curve the street with the park? In a way, giving priority to the landscape and that the architecture is subservient or is secondary to what's happening with the shock waves of, uh, of the park. Uh, they said yes, uh, which we couldn't believe, uh, because they hadn't yet asphalted the street. So uh, they then made a curve. Uh, that then basically gave us, uh, we said, we respect Robert Stern's master plan, so it's the rectangle above, and then we love the, uh, the field ops uh, park so that's the, the, the kind of concave curve. Uh, we were also really loving all of the kind of steel uh, uh, inspiration that was just around. And so it basically creates for $290 a square foot, uh, which you know, is still uh, a, a kind of uh, maybe a handsome amount in uh, places like Virginia. But in a competitive market like Philadelphia, that's about uh, bottom dollar for, for uh, office uh, buildings. Uh, we've created this uh, really, I think, uh, generous uh, um, building that uses parking garage precast uh, construction. So we, we called up a precast company that only does T-beams in parking garages and said, would you be interested in making these uh, very large scale panels uh, for us uh, on this facade? And they said yes. And they were so proud of it because they, for the first time, really had their precast kind of experience really shown or celebrated. So they all came, the whole factory came down to the building when it was finished and held a party uh, for, for, for the team uh, because they were, they were pretty proud of it. The other thing, because it's uh, nautical uh, and we were two blocks away from the water, we built a periscope into the lobby. So it has a mirror at the top that reflects the ships that are uh, kind of the boneyard uh, in, the, uh, in the area. And then just subtle things like, if you, if you notice every floor is getting smaller, 
Uh, so the atrium is not the same size all the way up because they want more square footage uh, at the higher levels so that they can make more money. So like it is, it is pretty sick. Uh, uh, <laughs> what you have to sort of go against in order to uh, make something uh, as, as simple as a periscope. So here is the project. Um, and, and again, I, I'm very proud of this project because it shows that you can bring architecture to a spec office building in, in Philadelphia. Um, we also finished a renovation project, a ref refurb. Uh, this is Basel, Switzerland, home of Herzog Demeron. And we got to do a project in the armpit of Basel. Uh, called Dry Spitz, right down there. And uh, I say that because it's literally the, uh, it's all of the stuff that they didn't want in the center of the city because it's extremely beautiful. So they put all of this, the crappy stuff into Dry Spitz. And, uh, and it's like these long warehouses and, and things. Um, and so it's, it was kind of a forgotten place, but now that the city needs space and needs uh, cool things, Suddenly, this kind of ar armpit actually is now uh, the center of uh, a huge uh, refurbish uh, refurbishment into a, a, an arts uh, college. Uh, so uh, we got to look at this 1970s warehouse that was pretty nondescript. And uh, it has this immaculate uh, concrete work. Uh, it's so solid there. The windows are so small. And we were asked to make it into a residential project. So, of course, we were thinking of, well, if it has no uh, uh, you know, lights going uh, from the outside in, maybe we can create a courtyard uh, and, and have a beautiful glass uh, kind of courtyard. But we kind of took that idea away, and we created this kind of zigzag where the courtyard becomes these like triangular kind of pieces. So we, we, we placed three levels on top of the existing one, so the cores are all the same as they would be. By twisting the, uh, the, uh, the, the each uh, kind of uh, core, not, not, not the core itself, but each kind of uh, residential pod uh, that's connected to the core, we have a, still a very pragmatic structural layout. We pull either end, and we have uh, a, a building that has actually um, kind of transformed this uh, old 70s warehouse into a very kind of living uh, uh, quality. Um, and now it's a fully uh, resided building, uh, which just opened a couple of months ago. Um, these are probably projects that you may know of or have only seen renderings or models of. Uh, so it's really, I'm really happy to kind of be able to show you the kind of production that's happened. Uh, the other project that's opening in just a couple of months is on the west coast of Denmark. It's an area that the Germans uh, had taken over in uh, World War II. And uh, there's a very powerful movie out right now. The Danes had it up for the foreign Oscar. It's called Land of Mine. And it was that the Germans had placed, I think, over uh, a few million mines on the beaches of uh, Denmark to, uh, because they thought that the Americans and the English were coming that way. Uh, as opposed to uh, France. And so they built these bunkers. Uh, and this bunker had been built almost finished, but they never brought the, the gun, the turret. So um, it's this uh, bunker museum that we're creating to tell the story of this uh, period of life in, in this neighborhood, uh, in, this, in this setting. So uh, we are not allowed to touch any single uh, sand dune. It's a protected UNESCO World Heritage Site, uh, except the sand dune that was created by the Germans building the bunker. So uh, there was this pile of sand adjacent to the bunker that we have then created into four uh, kind of community museums. So you literally walk down the sandy dune uh, into the entrance, which is through the old bunker, uh, and then you move underground into these four separate uh, museum rooms uh, where we don't even have doors. We really sort of try to sort of uh, walk through cracks and walk through kind of uh, these, these openings um, to create uh, these subterranean rooms that uh, basically tell the story. This is just a few weeks from being finished. So 
uh, I can't show you the, the finished things, but still you can see kind of uh, the quality of the space. It's very small, um, and yet it's very, very important for the local people uh, who live there. Um, and then uh, we're still sort of in the finishing stages of this. Um, and then you see the skylights that look down into the uh, four separate uh, uh, spaces, museum spaces. So that's something to look forward to in the next couple of uh, uh, months. The other one is a high school uh, on the Faroe Islands that is uh, made up of uh, basically three different high schools. Um, the Faroe Islands has a uh, problem in that all of the kids are moving out of the islands uh, and never coming back because they moved to Copenhagen, Stockholm, or Paris, wherever, and uh, they, they somehow just, uh, the, the population of the island is dwindling. And so what the mayor has thought about is in the 60s, they had separated all of the high schools. So there was like the, the, the kind of, uh, there was the mechanics high school, and then there was like the business high school, and then there was the beautician high school, and all of these like different kind of entities. And they feel that one of the reasons that the uh, kids are basically moving away is that they never really meet. Uh, so this was basically to create a social incubator uh, for future babies uh, on the <laughs> islands of the Faroe Islands. And so uh, we have now uh, placed the beauticians on top of the mechanics, uh, and they can basically see everything that's being done in the, in the shop. Uh, and there is a big atrium that's currently covered. This would be all open. Uh, they can have dance parties in there, just like we remember from our own high school uh, period. But uh, for them, it's really like a first, a uh, first in decades that they can actually all be together and have uh, fun. So uh, the, the mayor is kind of staking his uh, political future on the successful growth of the Far Faroe Islands. Uh, this is the largest building in the history of, uh, of the island. Um, then uh, I'm going to kind of finish on just a couple of projects that we're working on currently. Uh, the Spiral is uh, a project that is in the Hudson Yards. Uh, it is done for Tishman Spire, who own um, the, uh, the Rockefeller Center. And any of you guys who've ever been to the Rockefeller Center, it is one of my favorite buildings, 1930s. Uh, take a look at the kind of, you know, it's an office tower. It has the function of an office tower, but it gives so much land and territory to community. Being the sort of the, the big wide promenade, you have this ice skate rink, you have events that are always programmed in that area. You have gardens on every flat area all the way up to the top of the rock. And um, it's this marriage of kind of a public um, kind of uh, programming uh, on all of this private kind of office complex. And uh, it's, I think, a, a really great way to be inspired on how to design a uh, office building for our generation. So we have a site that's right here. Um, this is the typical zoning envelope. You always have to step back at certain sort of uh, points. The high line actually ends right at the corner, kitty corner to our site. And we're talking about why not take the high line into the skyline by sort of uh, creating this kind of spiral uh, outdoor garden that goes all the way to the, uh, the very, very top. And um, this is the idea that people love the high line. They love sort of being able to occupy it in different scales and in uh, different uh, modes. What if you could actually work uh, adjacent to just uh, that same kind of uh, quality? And, uh, and have that go up all the way. Um, so taking typical floor plates that you have in any office building, uh, you of course have to talk about what you're losing in terms of making this kind of uh, generous uh, space succeed. But also what's interesting is that certain uh, types of companies now are actually demanding more communal spaces uh, in addition to workspaces. So it's also about what the actual leasers uh, and leasees are actually asking for so that uh, you're starting to see a shift, I think, uh, to these outdoor spaces actually uh, uh, being monetized uh, because they can ask for higher rents uh, in the places that uh, are, are workspaces. So this is also to help 
uh, communication through the different levels. You have the same space indoors as outdoors, so it's kind of a shared uh, uh, space that's, uh, that's green and landscape. Uh, uh, you know, if you talk about uh, <clears throat> biophilia and the idea of actually bringing trees and green indoors to help with air quality and uh, even performance. So th th these are all things that we're kind of working on with that project. Um, then uh, we're designing, of course, in Vancouver. Uh, this is the flat iron that everyone knows from New York. We're designing the fat iron. Um, this is a, a project that's under construction that's now popped out of the ground. It's a residential tower, and uh, it's uh, going to hopefully be done in the mid of 18. Um, then, uh, Ilo was mentioning before that I am working on the Big U. This is, a, of course, a much grander scale, a city scale of actually protecting the city against the flooding, which is in gray. Um, this is how kind of German precision can do it, because, uh, you know, you can literally bet your dollar that, uh, you know, even the weakest link in this is like purely, you know, totally secured. Uh, it's much harder to do that in, uh, in the United States. So we have to sort of uh, really think about passive systems of protection uh, uh, along with uh, uh, employables, de deployables. Uh, so we were really thinking and being inspired again by the High Line in that, you know, how do you take a social infrastructure piece that is the bridge and lay on a public program on top of it? Uh, how can we think of the social aspects of life, the activities that people all enjoy, and integrate them into the flood protection? So if you take Katrina, the storm in uh, New Orleans, where the Corps of Engineers just came and built uh, basically a 10, 12-foot concrete wall that everyone's going to stare at for the next uh, uh, you know, uh, 20, 40, 50 years, we wanted to not build a concrete wall, but to really build a flood system, protection system that uh, uh, adds to the quality of the city. And so it's a piece of urban furniture that also protects. Um, it's uh, a park uh, that uh, you know, is there for everyone to enjoy 99.9% .9 of the time. And then it's also there to, again, protect uh, you against uh, future storm events. So. Um, then uh, a, a project that maybe few of you only know about is we're designing uh, one of uh, Paris's new metro stations. Um, this is on the outskirts of Paris, uh, really connecting two uh, neighborhoods that have been uh, disconnected for the last uh, five to six decades because of how the roads have been built. Uh, and we're trying to now tie these two uh, uh, neighborhoods uh, together through a piece of uh, public investment. So here it shows the history of these neighborhoods and the kind of roads and railways and things that were built over time to kind of cut everything off. Uh, this is our site, uh, that little square right there. Um, this is what it looks like now with the metro stations, and this is what they're planning on building over the next uh, 20 years. It's a very extensive new network. Uh, also, Charles de Gaulle Airport is just adjacent to our site. So that makes this uh, a super special, uh, uh, important piece. And uh, it's six levels uh, where we uh, basically are connecting uh, the subway stations to transfer stations to bus uh, depots at the top. And uh, it's a project that we're doing out of our Copenhagen office. Uh, we really wanted, to, this is very sort of Danish, bring natural light into the depths. So there's not many stations that I know of in Paris where natural light hits the, the bottom of the, uh, of the station. Uh, in Battersea, uh, London, we are, are designing a square, so not a, not a building at all. Uh, this is the beautiful power station that uh, uh, was uh, kind of worked for 50, 60 years and then became the setting for a lot of dark movies. Uh, and uh, the animals uh, cover uh, for Pink Floyd. Um, and a lot of people have uh, purchased this over the last sort of 20, 30 years trying to make it. The Malaysians have now uh, committed 9 billion pounds, uh, which is a, not a small piece of sum of money. But they literally will be building it into a residential and uh, commercial area. Um, and they needed a kind of a soul. This is the scale and size of uh, Times Square in, uh, in New York. So we're designing 
basically uh, an, a, a, a public square that can also function as a theater and a place to actually uh, come to see performance, just like Times Square is a place that people come. Uh, the shape and the design of it really grew out of how people actually flow through the site, uh, looking at where people uh, just would naturally kind of congregate, and uh, then placing a theater kind of seating uh, on both edges. Um, we also are inspired uh, in Malaysia through the kind of uh, natural uh, shape of the Mulu Caves. And what we've decided to do is to sort of uh, take aggregate, take uh, stone uh, from 33 different stone quarries uh, around Malaysia that have the kind of rainbow colors that you see here, and then literally uh, mix that aggregate uh, with, um, with the uh, concrete that you're pouring these different steps. So you literally are walking across uh, all of Malaysia by walking uh, through this uh, site. So it really becomes the kind of the, the heart and the soul of, uh, of Mal Malaysia Square or of uh, the entire Battersea project. Um, so this is a project that's starting construction soon. And then it's uh, the power station. So at night it becomes the electric boulevard and it lights up and really carries people from the tube station into the heart of the, of the project. Um, and then uh, many of you probably know Super Keelan, another project, a park uh, that is made up of uh, 100 different uh, pieces uh, that we uh, kind of, uh, there are 60 different nationalities that live around this park. And they kind of came up with a 1,000 different objects that we could place in the park. Uh, we whittled that down to 100 and basically curated a one kilometer long stretch of Copenhagen uh, where a Moroccan fountain is now, boom, in the middle of Copenhagen, uh, where a dentist sign from Qatar uh, is, uh, is uh, saying that uh, brush your teeth. Um, you have uh, these guys from Baghdad, a Thai boxing rink. So literally things uh, from all over kind of sourced uh, and saying that, you know, if you walk through this park, you actually see a little bit uh, of your own uh, uh, self in the park. Uh, even the landscaping is sourced from different areas. So these are palm trees in, from China that grow in a Scandinavian climate. And uh, the park itself really took on an amazing uh, life of its own. It became this ad for the iPhone 6 camera uh, and was uh, pictured everywhere around the world. Um, and it's so much about uh, the life of the people and, and how uh, proud they are. These uh, two Palestinian girls brought soil from Palestine and laid it on top of uh, the mountain. And so it's really a, a park by the people uh, where we just became sort of a tool or an instrument uh, to, make, uh, to make this uh, happen. Uh, I'm finishing up uh, just with Google. Um, I love this. This shows kind of the uh, organizational uh, uh, way of these different tech companies. You know, you have Steve Jobs in the middle telling everyone what to do. Uh, Facebook is a social network. Uh, Microsoft uh, uh, puts all the teams together and then they fight uh, each other to see who gets uh, Bill Gates' uh, kind of, uh, the legal department is larger in Oracle than the actual engineering department. It's, it's like so amazing. So uh, we, uh, what we discovered uh, with, um, with Google is that it's all about systems. And uh, when you think of a church search system and telecommunication system and transportation system, they're really about thinking uh, of uh, how to, um, to do. And, and one of the, uh, I think one of the very interesting things, they decided not to choose one architect, but to actually have two working together. So Thomas Heatherwick and us were both selected to work together. And uh, when you think about the way that they solve things, uh, these are engineers, and when they have a problem, they stick 10 engineers into a room, and they uh, call it a scrum, and then they actually solve the problem together. There's no kind of true ego trip uh, as much as there is, uh, I'd say, in architecture, where it's, you know, you're so busy to kind of make a style or make a statement or make something that is your own that uh, the, uh, the previous four architects that worked at Google on their headquarters were always as, you know, it was as important to make their statement as it was to make Google's headquarters. And they wanted that kind of out. They said, you're working for us. 
you're solving our problems and you need to make an architecture that is for us. So that's pretty remarkable uh, as a brief. Uh, they have historically, over the last 25 years, only worked in existing buildings and taken them over from Sun Microsystems and others. Uh, they've been so busy making things that uh, they really haven't uh, ever done architecture. And so um, it's been uh, three years that we've worked with them to create a master plan, and now we're designing three buildings with about four to 5,000 people working in each. Uh, what's also remarkable is that these Silicon Valley companies are actually becoming larger than the cities that they are working within. So this is the kind of business district of Mountain View. Uh, it's smaller than the actual Google campus. So uh, they are, are not only designing buildings, they're designing uh, bus routes and bus systems. They're designing schools and housing. Uh, really, uh, again, lots of different things than just uh, building a campus for housing. And when you consider that that's the same case for YouTube or Facebook or an Apple, they, these are larger systems that uh, they are building in each case. So we start with the habitat. Uh, we uh, then are designing a dome, uh, basically a Buckminster Fuller inspired kind of macro uh, climate. And then we create a human scale underneath that, uh, that dome structure uh, to create these like, uh, flexible and, uh, and serviceable and also penetrable uh, spaces. Uh, it's very important uh, for Mountain View to be able to access and move through this campus so it's not like a UFO uh, that's just been set onto the, uh, onto the ground. Um, so there's also a lot of uh, uh, balance between actual uh, healthy environments, biophilic design, and working environments to create that, that balance. Um, so it's been one of our most uh, uh, really um, challenging clients and uh, super, super interesting. The uh, roof now is actually a flexible PV, which will actually generate uh, more energy than they actually need. Um, we're also working on the Hyperloop uh, transportation system uh, with Hyperloop One, uh, designing the uh, stations as well as engineering, helping to engineer some of the actual pods that are moving through the pipes. Uh, the first uh, phase of this will actually be probably built for the Dubai World Expo in 2020. Uh, I'll move through this one really quick because I wanted to sort of end. Uh, we're doing master plan in Pittsburgh. Um, this again is kind of uh, taking all of these things, architecture, landscape architecture, I think uh, space planning and uh, um, everything kind of together. So uh, anyone who knows or is from Pittsburgh knows that that was the site of the igloo, uh, Buckminster Fuller's uh, d uh, retra retractable dome, the first of its kind in the world. And it was, you know, it was basically working for a couple of years and then kind of stopped. Um, and uh, they, the hockey team then built its own stadium and suddenly the sea of parking in the center of a city uh, was uh, prime land to develop. So we have 3 million square feet of both residential and office. And the way that most uh, streets are built in, in Pittsburgh, it's very t uh, topographical. So there's, there's steep inclines like San Francisco. And on our site, uh, the smallest incline is actually 14%, which would always make it uh, car uh, kind of uh, dominant. And we wanted to create a master plan that no pathway was more than 5%. So instead of a grid of streets, we prioritized a network of paths that crisscross, zigzag, uh, all the way up the hill. And uh, so, you know, of course, the streets are there. They, they're a kind of necessary evil. But uh, we wanted to create and prioritize the ability to walk from the top of the hill down or vice versa. And so we created also a spine, a green zigzag that goes all the way up. Again, no more than 5%. And what you notice is that the buildings are actually, uh, you know, they are a result of whatever the paths basically create. So you, you, look at the, you look at the grade, and then the buildings are kind of these leftover things versus the way that we usually design is make the streets first, then a grid of buildings, and then the, uh, the green spaces are kind of residual pocket parts. 
We did it the uh, opposite of way around. We did uh, the zigzag of, uh, of paths, then the green space, and then the buildings kind of pop out as, as uh, thirds. And um, this uh, is now currently in front of the mayor, and the mayor is like looking at uh, how to move this through uh, the, the permitting. Uh, this is what they typically build for residential. We said that if they actually looked at designing it in a terrace sort of way, like creating a new Pittsburgh-esque kind of housing typology, they could actually take advantage of that same uh, beautiful uh, terrain. And so uh, here we are uh, on the, the uh, spaces closer to the downtown area, of course, get to uh, rise up. Uh, but they never rise up so high that they take views away from actually uh, the very buildings at the top of the hill, the existing hill. So here are some of the terraced housing that you see here. Uh, so that you could imagine sort of living in this terraced residential area and having a beautiful view, everyone sharing um, either collectively or individually in their apartments these uh, incredible views. So this is a project that we're awaiting to see uh, what will happen. Finally, I will conclude on that, uh, that ski slope on top of the power plant. Again, I think to make a point that uh, architects can actually design almost everything. I mean, this is really the realm of engineers. Power plants are not something that people come to architects for. But we feel that you can actually have a very important contribution to uh, just that very kind of uh, that typology. So one bag of trash is equal to four hours of electricity and four hours of heat. Uh, 400,000 tons of waste go into this facility every year and 550,000 residents get their heat and their uh, electricity from there. Um, so, you know, if, if engineers are left to this, this is the kind of architecture or this is the kind of space quality that we get. Uh, and so we just basically said, if you are building the, gener you know, the, the tallest building in all of Denmark uh, and the most expensive one to replace this 60-year-old uh, this factory uh, uh, power plant, then why not actually make it into something that is more than just a power plant? So on your mountains of trash, we graft a, a, a ski slope, uh, basically taking uh, one of Sweden's uh, famous ski areas and just boop, plopping it, having the same kind of runs. Um, <clears throat> so you'll basically take an elevator up and run down this, uh, this power plant. So we've been showing this, of course, for the last uh, six, seven years. And uh, now I'm really proud to sort of also show that it's really moving forward. It'll be, f it's basically finished as a power plant. It's now actually burning trash. Uh, by the summer, it'll actually have the ski slope on top, which is a synthetic ski slope uh, made up of pop bottles that are recycled. And then whenever it snows in the winter, the snow will actually stay on top of the, of the, of the recycled plastic. It'll have the world's tallest, uh, climbing wall as well. And as the last piece, we are basically blowing out smoke rings out of the, uh, out of the uh, smokestack instead of uh, having just a trail of smoke. So these are some of the last latest pictures of the facade actually uh, being completed. And uh, we're, pl we're putting plants also into the, uh, these are planters, and it'll be like a tree line. So at some point, the planters will actually stop uh, there's the starting of the of the um, of the climbing wall as well, and so when you come in 2018, you'll be able to don some skis in Copenhagen and uh, go down your first ski slope. So uh, something that I think is important is how we can basically add our design thinking to cities, uh, so that uh, you can make things like this possible. Here's a test. <laughs> so this is like us trying to show in our own prototypes that we've actually funded part ways through Kickstarter um, how to build this one-to-one -one, because you can't just go to a store and buy a smoke uh, sort of a ring generator. So uh, this is also to say, whenever something is about to stop you, think twice, see if you can actually make it uh, happen and real. Thank you very, very much.
I'll take some questions for your, any of you. Yes. They're deflectors that are underneath. So the question was, uh, you know, how do you deal with the heat? There's a lot of things to actually deal with in a power plant like that. But uh, there are also answers to most things. Uh, the biggest thing that we realized is the, the competition was made originally to just make the building more pretty. And that's why they asked architects to kind of, you know, join in and make it more pretty. Uh, we felt that that was like kind of... You know, you could do that, but you could do so much more. And so we realized that just to build a facade all the way around all four sides, you actually needed to connect them at the top just to create the kind of structural uh, stability. And by connecting them at the top, it didn't take that much more money to actually just create a, uh, a roof over the entire structure. And then we were like figuring out, well, what could you do up there? We started with like mountain biking trails and then it evolved into skiing because of the kind of the seasonality of everything. And then we had to figure out how to keep the snow on, uh, you know, there without the, the heat transfer. But the, the ovens are actually, uh, there are two ovens. They're towards the tallest part of the structure and um, they have deflectors that are deflecting the heat off of the roof. There were a couple more hands over there. Yep. So um, in addition to the cleverness of your design, I think it's safe to say that humor has played a big part in uh, the awareness of big and the uh, proliferation of just people knowing about it. What do, you, what do you have to say about like the role of humor or satire in architecture? I'll turn it around and say, why does everyone have to be drab and wear black? I mean, uh, it's like, uh, it's, it's absolutely ridiculous. I mean, we, we are supposedly the mirror of, you know, society. And I think that uh, you should and, and have in the past also had, you know, crazy. I mean, if you look at some of Corbu's pictures of him in a bumblebee costume, you would say that man is extremely humorous. Uh, and, uh, you know, humor, I think, is a very important element. It, it's... It's, it's how a lot of people deal with very difficult and challenging issues. Um, I think that you, one thing that I've learned uh, with working with Bjarke uh, so closely is that you have to build your tool of communication, of narrative. Remember his, his first office was named Plot. Now, Plot is like a plot on a plotter but it's also a plot of a story in a movie. And if any of you guys know, he's an incredible cinephile. So he, he has and knows so many movies and their storylines, and he can you know, uh, do uh, verbatim uh, uh, dialogue from so many movies. And it's the creation and the setting, the sonography uh, of uh, some of the projects and the stories, and that those stories then can capture support and people uh, sort of supporting those ideas that I think is really helping uh, some of these things getting built. Um, I also find it really amazing um, when over the years we've given lectures, there are two groups of people that kind of come straight down and kind of are, are extremely enthusiastic and supportive. And it's the 1960s hippies uh, because they had a utopian view of architecture and the world uh, back then, um, and it's the students. And it's because th I think there's also kind of this desire to work on, on you know, scales and uh, this, this maybe a kind of naivete of like anything is possible. And I think that it, it's really nice to uh, have those two groups of people kind of supporting the work. Yes. Uh, when you were, uh, you know, in school and young yourself, uh, who was a big influence on you and your work? Uh, um, it's a it's a great question. Um, I have Campbell Hall, the library, to thank for. I, I was a 
at my first job here at school to pay the bills was uh, I checked uh, in all of the new books that, uh, that came into the library. And I, uh, I worked the desk uh, also. Um, what that offered me was this incredible array of influences. And I have to say that seeing the works of Aldo van Eyck, uh, Hermann Hertzberger, um, Robert Maplethorpe, uh, like just being exposed to so many different views, uh, I was getting as much from working in that library as I did like in this room uh, for, for lectures. And so I, I really do think that it's about kind of like how you open yourself up for exposure and influence and inspiration. And that that really is the students you're sitting next to. It's the class across campus that's, you know, uh, uh, crazy uh, politics and intellectual Europe. Uh, it's, uh, it's the professors that you have. Um, it, it's kind of a mishmash of all of those things. And then I think uh, books that were extremely important for me that then set uh, uh, into motion a whole thing were uh, Narcissus, Narcissus and Goldman, uh, a, a book by Hermann Hesse about two brothers, and uh, Journey to the East by Corbusier, uh, which is about traveling. And that, uh, you know, I think traveling and getting out of the dark room uh, is as important as actually spending a few years in here. Yes. Um, most people would say Ulrich is very modern, um, but I noted that you used Bay Windows in your work. And coming from UVA, I was wondering what other traditional elements you used. Oh, that's a that's a hilarious. That's the first time I've been asked that. So. Uh, architecture is actually made up of uh, classical elements. I mean, a column, uh, a lentil, an entablature. You'd be surprised. Like, we, uh, we have friezes in our projects. Uh, we, we, we riff on all of kind of history's uh, greatest hits. Um, it's just that, you know, we, we may use elements uh, that are inspired uh, by historical architecture in ways that you won't find uh, the direct connection to. So you would, you would need to like tour the Danish Maritime Museum to get uh, an, an kind of an, a, a quality of space that is in some ways very much like, you know, an agora in Greece is about creating a space to exchange ideas and to come and it was open 24 seven and senators and street vendors were all there and no money was exchanged it was just ideas and so we took a shipbuilding uh, dock that was abandoned um, a dry dock and for us that is today's agora that's a 24 7 accessible place anyone can go into it and it's where townspeople are supposed to meet and exchange ideas there's plays there's all kinds of stuff that happens there uh, because they have suddenly a new room in the community that they didn't have before. Um, so I, I, I think that there are a lot of ways to have Carol Westfall influence your architecture, uh, to any who remember him. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes, sure. So we've actually grown to a pretty considerable size. We're about 460 folks now, uh, split between three offices, uh, primarily New York and Copenhagen. Um, I would say that we, uh, the, 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 the kind of design conceptualization happens uh, anywhere from six to 10 to 12 weeks. Uh, that's where we create concepts for the variety of projects that we're doing. Uh, some of those are public tenders, some are private commissions that are direct, others are kind of strategy idea thinking that doesn't really have a built project with it. Um, they tend to be, uh, we have 12 partners, so 10 of those partners are design partners. Uh, they are kind of, they accompany those projects. 
but it's really the project leader and the project team themselves that are producing a lot of the work. And then we have what we call a weekly PDF, which I think Yarka inherited from OMA. That's how Rem works as well, because he's traveling so much, is that every Friday, uh, Bjarke and a, and a few handful of partners get uh, 50 to 60 PDFs uh, in from the different projects. And then they have the weekend to kind of go through them uh, and comment and provide direction. And uh, that's, that's kind of how it happens on a weekly basis. And then whenever Bjarke is in the different offices, he'll basically engage the different groups uh, to work with them one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. So it's, um, that, that's the kind of way of working in terms of process, both in terms of communication through PDFs. And the PDFs need to be very concise. So you, you basically, in a few pages, are, you're, you're detailing what has happened in the decision making over the last few days, what is important for decisions to be made in order to impact the next few days, and you're giving an overall picture of where we are in the in the project. Yes, I hope you guys choose UVA for your uh, graduate school. Thank you.